live on YouTube. So welcome to the 17th annual Portland All Jazz Workshop, 17 years. <laughs> We're all that much older. <laughs> so I think out of that first batch, I think Dan and I are the, that are here physically, are, are the, the two that were here, the very first one. I was too. You were here too, yes. yes with Richard Barry. Yeah, yeah Richard, Richard Barry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Russ. And Russ, that's right, yeah. Uh, Dave Rowe, I think. Not the first one. Not the, not the very first one, no, I don't think so. Their memory is, yeah. So anyway, so we left off last year with a little conversation about how we might want to change up the agenda, the format going forward. So we, we have done that. I think if you've looked at the agenda, you've seen um, some additional topics that we haven't covered in the past. There is also a co-chair now, that's Mel, Mel Bartels. He's a co-chair, we never had a co-chair. Um, it was, I did my darndest to get him to volunteer to be the, the chair, but um, co-chair is best I could do. Um, but it's been a really good collaboration because we've had a lot of discussions about, based on the feedback we got at the end of last year's meeting, how we wanted to move forward for this year. And so I think it was really fruitful. And I'm excited that we have a wider range of topics, not just about, you know, advanced telescope making, but, you know, also and primarily why are we making these telescopes? What do we use them for? I mean, they're just not, I mean, there are some people, and there's one person I know of for sure who would build a telescope, put it in the garage and start building the next one. Uh, but most of us actually use our telescopes. So, so that's a part of the agenda this year. And I hope going forward, um, we have more of a, a beginner's perspective on things as well as the advanced. So it's the mix I think that will be more interesting and hopefully inspiring to more people. Um, the advanced stuff can be a little off-putting because it's like, what are they talking about? I, I, people don't know how, how, to, how to put that into perspective. I'm not ignoring you out in Zoom. Sorry, talking to the people here. So anyway, so that's where we are. And um, I think I gave myself 15 minutes to talk about this and I've only gone five. And that's all I really have to say on that. So I'm going to launch into my presentation, which is uh, one of the fruits of that discussions that we've had starting last year. And yeah. Since it's a small group, should we just introduce ourselves online and in person? Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone is um, has turned off their their video. I mean, their audio and video, some of them. So, yeah, I think we can do that. Well, I'm Howard Bannett, in case you didn't know. We have a mobile camera. Put that to the yeah. So, okay. And you are? Hi, I'm Sam Grums. Sam Grums. I'm Rob Brown. Rob Brown. Oops, get a little tipsy there. Dan Gray. Dan Gray, he's our host. Uh, Alan Slisky. Jerry Oldian. Tim Anderson. I'm Chris Anderson. I'm Robert Asamendi. Mel Bartels. There I am. There we go. Barbara Baychak with him. Okay, there we go. Okay, so so that's us. If anyone out there wants to introduce themselves, although we can see your names on underneath your phone, underneath your uh, video. Excuse the uh, crazy. There we go. Okay. So okay, Howard, right. can you so can you hear? Get can going. you hear? I'm going to bring up my presentation. Can anybody hear me? Your screen. We can yeah. hear you. Oh, good. Hey, R Richard, how you doing? This is Joe. Uh, hi, Joe. Yeah. I'm. I'm here. Yeah. I, I was trying to figure out how to. The barbecue change will my... be after the two presentations. So we can wait. My name. We'll just, it'll All taste right. that good. much better because we'll be so much hungrier. Yes. Notice I have. <laughs> um. 
let's see, I needed to, to share, I needed to have this up and going. Okay. Come on, Zoom, come up. Hello. Why won't Zoom come up here? Okay, we can see. Okay, well, things are going so well, getting everything set up, and that made me nervous. So my nervousness is proving to be well-founded. <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. So we can see. Um... All right. Aha. There you go. See, see, there's always someone who knows what to do. All right. So now I'm going to try to share my screen. And uh, here we go. Okay. All right. Get that full screen. Full screen. There we go. Okay, so this is really in the wrong spot. All right, and this can be, there we go. Move it up out of the way. Okay, so observing by sketching. Um, yeah, I've, I've built telescopes since I was 14, and you'll see some of them here in a few minutes. Um, but every single one of them I built so I could observe something new or something in a different way. Um, and as I got into it as a teenager more, I found that by sketching, I could see more. Um, I could see more detail. I could see fainter things. I could see things I never thought I could see. So that's that's what this is about. Okay, now if I can get this to <laughs> advance. Well, this is a lovely, a lovely photo um, that you're looking at. All right, page up, page down, space bar, shift, enter. All right, let's try this. Click on, click on the picture and then close. Ah, okay. There we go. It's always somebody who knows. Um, so I'll start off by saying sketching is not the best way to observe for everybody. Um, you know, no one thing is best for anybody, especially in a hobby. I mean, we're out here. This is for fun. And if it's not fun, we're not. That's the only way you can't do amateur astronomy right is if you're not having fun. Um, I like these two pictures showing people at their telescopes and binoculars um, with their sketch pads. So people do sketch. I'm not the only one. Um, and so I mentioned that I have pictures of some of the telescopes I've built and used through the years. And, um, and here they go. This one down here, you can see my cursor. This is my very first telescope. That's an 8-inch F4 on a modified English mount. It's 14 years old. I um, I made the mirror. I had all this um, scrap wood laying around that my dad had left over. And I saw a picture of that type of mount in a book and thought, wow, that's the way you make a telescope. This is 1970. So this is well before I ever heard about Adopsoni. But it worked. Um, this is what it looks like today. This is fixed height eyepiece uh, Adopsonian. Um, it's 20 inch uh, obsession building sitting on top of a equatorial mount I built. It's my old 28 inch F4. This is a 12 and a half inch F8. 
Well, this is my current 30 inch f 2.73. This is a 90 inch Bach telescope at Kid Peak. Um, and this is me standing at the back end of Jimmy Lowry's 48 inch F4 in his home observatory in West Texas. Yeah, that's a telescope. <laughs> you can, that's a great telescope. I could I could do a presentation on just that, but that's not what we're doing here. So I like I like this page from one of my observing notebooks. Um, and the reason I like it is, you know, look at the sketch here, NGC 7331. Um, you can see the spiral disk goes up into the notes I had for the previous object. And I ended up adding a fourth galaxy over here on the next page over. And the reason for that was that I didn't see this and I didn't see the spiral disk coming out that far when I started to sketch. I also didn't see the dark lane. But as I sketched, it was like, oh, there's a dark lane. And I kept the spiral disk kept getting longer and longer and longer. And oh, look, there's a bar in this companion galaxy, or what looks like a bar. So to me, this is just an illustration on how sketching, which is just a technique for paying closer attention, can help you see more than just a glance in the eyepiece. Now, there are other ways to do this other than sketching. Our next speaker, Steve Gottlieb, he does pretty much the same thing with words. Um, I can't do that because I think every hour into the night, I get stupider and stupider and stupider, and my words just go away. I can't describe nothing. So, so for me, sketching is, is the way to be able to capture what I've seen. So the sketch there on, on the right is uh, my pencil sketch of M77 using Jimmy Lowry's 48 inch. Um, that was quite the uh, quite the look. He gave me, he and Steve, actually, we were observing together. They said, oh, why don't you take the next hour and just sketch whatever you want? And I said, okay. <laughs> so this is what I sketched on the 48 inch. So, so sketching does look complicated. And it looks like you have to be really artsy and have a really real flair for the artistic. Mm, that helps. Sure, that really helps. Um, but the idea... You know, other than just being able to see more by paying attention, is just capturing the essence of what you're seeing. You're not trying to produce, I'm not trying to produce the work of art at the eyepiece, because that would require an array of pencils, an array of erasers, smudgers, this and that and the other thing, that is just too much for me to deal with in the dark. So I just make a, a quick pencil sketch at the eyepiece, and I finish it later, the next day or whenever, when uh, I have the time, um, which, you know, for me is a lot of fun because since I was a kid, I've been a doodler. You know, the kids in, in class back in grade school, they're always kind of looking down and their pencils moving around and they're sketching rocket ships or whatever, and or maybe the kid off to the side. And um, that was me. I mean, I wasn't paying attention to what the teacher was saying very much. I was just kind of sketching. Okay, now this is right from my current sketching notebook, observing notebook. This was done this past spring at Chickahominy Reservoir, and you probably can't even recognize what it might be. So the Rosette Nebula. This is, and it's like, this chunk over here is actually part of this chunk over here. I just started to redraw it on this side of the page. You can see how unartistic how unfinished it is, but it's capturing the essence of what I was seeing. And, and that's how, this is how most of my sketches start out, how some of them stay. And very few that you'll see in the rest of the presentation are actually finished to really show as much as I really saw. They like this one. Um, <laughs> the Great Orion Nebula. Um, this is a project that took me hours over several winters. Because, you know, the, the winters here in Western Oregon, 
you don't get that many clear nights. So this was a long-term project and uh, I was really happy to finally be able to finish it. And, you know, like it says, I, I have no artistic talent as what most people think when they think about sketching. Yeah, I get that. This looks pretty artistic. Um, I am not that artistic. This looks as good as it does because I cheat. I got for, for this and every other sketch that you're going to see, I get a photograph. I put sketching paper over that photograph and I sketch the outline of the nebula. I plot where the main stars are. And now I can sketch and make a final drawing that looks so good. I couldn't, I couldn't do this freehand at the eyepiece in a million years. Oh, good. That's showing up nicely up there. So, yeah, so this isn't about art. Um, this is about seeing everything you can. And, and that's what I try to tell people who are even remotely interested in trying their hand at sketching at the eyepiece. Because if you want to see everything you can see that your eyes and your telescope are capable Sketching is a great way to go if you want to do it. If you don't want to do it, you're not going to see nothing because you'll hate it. This is um, M82 with uh, my old 28 inch. Um, and I hear people say, well, sketching takes too much time. It takes too long. You know, I want to see, I want to see so many things when I'm out under the stars. There's so much to see. And I, boy, do I get that. Um, I, uh, I, Back in the 90s, I did a couple of the um, Astronomical League's observing lists, the Herschel 400 and the, the second 400 objects, and did the galaxy clusters. I mean, those are just hundreds and hundreds of objects. And I got into the rhythm is that I want to see as many of these as I can every night. I didn't sketch any of those. I just wrote a cryptic note that I saw it, and it looked kind of like this, and off to the next one. If I didn't see 20 objects a night, I wasn't doing very well. Um, so, yeah, in, in that type of scenario, and a lot of people observe that, okay? Um, yeah, sketching does take too much time. Sketching slows you down because it forces you to pay attention. And like I said, that's kind of the whole idea. Now, this sketch of M82 is one of my most remarkable things I've ever seen. Um, this is from Steens Mountain. In 2015, uh, early in the morning, in um, I think it was October of uh, 2015, and you know it's one of those moments when the sky got out of the way, the atmosphere just stopped doing all the crazy stuff that it usually does, and look at all that crazy detail. I couldn't believe it. It was like lacy laziness everywhere uh, this doesn't really capture it as well as the eyepiece view um and this is the the sketch that started my career writing for sky and telescope m51 um this is another one of those sketches that took several years over many nights um over the very best nights to, to put together with my 28 inch. Um, and as I mentioned easier, I keep it earlier. I keep it easy. I make it as easy on myself as I can at the eyepiece while I'm sketching. I have white unlined paper in my notebook and I have a mechanical pencil using 0.7 millimeter lead. There's an eraser on the end and that's all, all I use. If I need to smudge something, I'll use my finger. Um, again, I'm just trying to capture the essence and also, again, all these sketches you're seeing are the finished versions. None of these sketches, except for that one on the rosette, um, were, were, were done at the eyepiece. Yeah, this is the one I hear all the time. I can't even draw a straight line. Anybody thinking that? Okay, there's, there's a couple, yeah. There's always some people who, that's what comes to mind. I can't even draw a straight line. And you know what? I can't either. Um, straight, drawing straight lines freehand is really hard. If you have a straight edge, sure, zip, there you go. Um, the fortunate thing I also like to point out is that in all the things I've seen in the night sky, 
there's only one thing I've seen that is actually really straight. And that's the uh, relativistic jet coming out of the middle of M87. And that's only for the first half. Then it gets wiggly at the end. Um, so if, if, if this is holding you back, not being able to draw a straight line, you can relax. You can sketch because astronomically, you're not going to run into straight lines. And this is a sketch of M33 um, that uh, this was in last November's issue of Sky and Telescope. I wrote an article. In this November's issue, there's another article about M33, which I think is a lovely compliment. I think those two go together really well. Okay, this is the uh, M8, the Lagoon Nebula. The, the picture you saw at the beginning, you me sitting at the telescope pointing up at the beautiful Milky Way. This is the rough sketch I was drawing then has been turned into this finished pencil drawing. Um, yeah, and this looks pretty artistic too, but this again is not what it's about. You know, a lot of these things that we sketch that are in the night sky are very beautiful. I mean, and, and if you can capture their essence even a little bit, your drawing is going to reflect that and it'll it'll look great. Even if there's lines going everywhere, which way, like in my rosette, you can capture that essence and you can keep that in your notes forever as a recording of what you saw. This is one of my favorite pages. Um, this is July 21st, 1994. I was at home using my eight inch F4 telescope. Um, this is also the, uh, the night of an RCA general meeting here in Portland. And just as the meeting was about to begin, a guy, one of their members burst into the auditorium and says, oh my God, you can see the, the SL9 uh, impacts on Jupiter. And everyone was stunned, They're just stunned. And the meeting concluded quickly and everyone left. And so this, I went home and I started making these sketches. I mean, these are a couple of dates, you know, 21st, 23rd, and 25th. Um, oh my gosh. I mean, if you saw it at all, you remember how incredible it was. I love this page because I look at this and go, wow, that's more than I remember seeing. If I just had to go by memory, I wouldn't have remembered all that. Um, that was such an exceptional event. Okay, so some things are really hard to sketch, <laughs> um, like Saturn. Um, there's uh, uh, an undeniable pull to be able to at least attempt sketching Saturn because it is so out of the, the normal realm of what we see every day. It is just such an exceptional sight. Um, I like this particular sketch of Saturn. I have a lot of them because this is one of two times I unambiguously saw Enki's gap, Enki's division. This tiny hairline curve right at the very tip of the visible rings. Um, and it helps too because the rings are kind of dusty, dusky right up to it. And then they're brighter right on the very rim, but I could actually see that dark line of Enki's gap. And it was thrilling. This was at an Oregon star party back in the 90s when Saturn was nearly up at the zenith. It was just before dawn. This is with the 20-inch obsession. And it was, again, one of those nights that the scene was just solid. This is at over a thousand power. So it looked it looked big in the eyepiece, just like it does here on the screen. Uh come and hail Bob. Um yeah, I had no idea what the what the area around the uh, pseudonucleus of a great comet would look like. And when it came along, it was like, holy crap, it looks like a water sprinkler to shoot stuff out out ahead of the, uh, you know, this is the pseudonucleus here. I mean, these, and every night 
it looked a little different. Um, and so I have a series of sketches showing those changes over time, which again, is just a great record. Yeah, you know, if you're a photographer, you capture all this and you know, on, back then on film and now on uh, your digital cameras um, and get a lot more detail. And if that's what you're into, it's great. But I'm into what I can see with my eyes. So this is what gets me going. And then Mars. Um, Mars is a bitch. Um, it's never big enough. The detail is never distinct enough to, to see well. Uh, even though these, these two drawings seem to imply otherwise, um, Mars is hard to see much detail on. Now this bottom sketch, this is in, from 2003 and it's at Oregon star party when Mars is at its great perihelic opposition. It's the closest it's gonna be in our lifetimes. And this sketch was made right around the time of closest approach, 2.50 AM. You can see all the filters I use, I use a minor viewer with the eyepiece of 10 millimeter radians and at 6.25 magnification. Um, even so, that was hard to see, uh, but I, I'm really, Seeing Olympus Mons right here, this little white patch, that was probably the coolest part of that that particular observation. This was my 20 inch obsession. This was just this was the last year of the, the obsession before the 28 inch. And this is probably the most difficult sketch I've ever made, which probably the you're thinking, why? Why? It's just a bunch of dots. Well, this is M7. A beautiful, bright, open cluster in Scorpius. Um, you know, these stars aren't, those aren't hard to, to draw. This is a, a globular cluster, which is actually, I think it's NGC 6445 or something like that. I could be wrong. But anyway, that's on the other side of the galactic core. So it's a miracle we can see this at all it's through the Milky Way. Anyway, drawing the Milky Way background, that's what made it so hard. I had to I had to invent a new technique to be able to do that. You know, invent a new technique to me, anyway. Um, and if anyone's ever interested, I'll be happy to share what that technique is. But it took a long time, and it was really tough to do. But I like how it turned out, because it does give the sense of the, of the billowy, billowy nature of the Milky Way. Yeah, and this is with the 30 inch f 2.73. Thank you, Mel. Um, okay, and this, I, I really like this. And this is M5, the globular cluster M5. Now, most people don't realize that there are two really bright variable stars in M5. Jerry's nodding knowingly, he knows. I read your article. He read my article. There you go. Um, and and you can see, I'll just kind of, whoop, there we go. You can see them go back and forth. This and it's just that dramatic in the eyepiece. The the difficult part is that those two variables seldom are at their brightest and dimmest at the same time. They're like a day and a half apart in their in their cycle. Um, so usually one's bright and the other isn't. But if you know exactly where to look, you can tell. And every time I look at M5, I check, and and I think the last time I checked, they were both a minimum. <laughs> Where'd they go? But this is really fun. I mean, because globular clusters, um, if you really paid attention to all the individual stars, night to night, and how bright they were, you would see this, this bubbling of, of, of variable stars. Within, within globular, they're called uh, cluster variables back in the old days, but uh, are our Lyra stars for the most part. Some Cepheids, Cepheids like these two are. Um, and to be able to record that on, on two pieces of paper is like, wow, okay, that's cool. And this one, um, this is a, you know, just look out here with this little hand-drawn arrow with this little dot, star-like dot. Um, that's a quasar. That is way out there. I mean, way out. Look at the Z, 3.911. 
um, light travel time of 12.1 billion years, gigalight years, what the real astronomers say. And the co-moving radial distance, as best as I understand, because when I look up the definition online, that one place is different than another place, but what I gather is that that co-moving radial distance is how far it is away from us now due to the expansion of the universe. So 23.662 billion years, billion light years away. <laughs> um, yeah. So that, that was, when I went after this one, I thought I'd be able to see it and I did, it wasn't hard. It was averted vision. Um, but the sensation of seeing that in the eyepiece and those extremely old photons making an impression on my eye brain system, I mean, it just gives me shivers. This was the 28 inch F4. Okay, and this is great. This is uh, sketching is just not for us amateurs. This gentleman is Dr. Ron Buddha. He was a professor of astronomer at the University of Alabama for many years. He's retired. Um, he is an expert on the morphology of spiral and oval disc galaxies. And basically what that means is that he studies why do galaxies look the way they do? What forces are at work to make this spiral look this way, but this other spiral look different? And why does this oval galaxy look this way and another one looks different? So that's what he studied. He was a student of Gerald de Vacaluris, who was also into galaxy morphology. And all through his graduate studies and his career as a professional astronomer, whenever he could, he made a point to actually sketch what he was studying after the, after the cameras are taken off the telescope. So he's looked through some really big telescopes and he, he had a web page on the University of Alabama site with all of his sketches, which are now gone. Ah, well. Though the sketch on the right here is one of my sketches that I thought would just be appropriate because it shows a bunch of different shaped galaxies. But um, he is, he must have them somewhere. I had the pleasure of meeting him this past spring when um, our next speaker, Steve Golub, and I traveled to uh, West Texas to meet up with uh, Jimmy Lowry and observe with his 48 inch. As it turned out, Ron was there. He had five nights observing time on the 82-inch Otto Struve telescope. Observing time for him to sketch. No cameras, nothing but his eyeball and some eyepieces on an 82-inch telescope. Now, I mean, come on. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, now, and so he invited us to join him on his last night. And so we did. Uh, we just, we couldn't say yes fast enough. Now, um, Ron is a gentleman's gentleman. And he's he's soft-spoken, but when he starts talking about galaxies, he gets excited. And when he starts talking about galaxies, after looking at them in the eyepiece of an 82-inch telescope, he's just bubbling over. And we got this master class in, in galaxy morphology that night that you just couldn't get anywhere else from anybody else in that way. Um, at one point in the evening, we thought, well, just for fun, let's point the scope at the uh, uh, Corona Borealis galaxy cluster. What's that? Um, uh, 2065, I think. And so we were expecting to see lots of galaxies, of course. And so the telescope operator, who was one of the astronomers, there at the University of uh, Texas McDonald's Observatory, um, who's also a friend of, uh, of Jimmy Lowry's. He, he moved the telescope over there and we look in and there is probably a hundred per eyepiece view. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it. When Ron looked, he, he just, he, he 
he yelled with glee. It was it was it was wonderful because we all did. So just because you're a professional astronomer doesn't mean you don't get excited. And it was it was just a great great experience. Right? Steve Steve remembers it very well, I'm sure. Um, and another thing I like about sketching is that I can get an overall view of an object that I can't see all at once in the, my eyepiece. I can draw pieces of it and then stitch them together like the Veil Nebula here. I mean, this is three, three degrees this way and three and a half this way. That's a big chunk of sky. Um, it barely fits in the IP, low power eyepiece of my eight inch F3.3 telescope just fits. I don't see all that detail. This is done all with 28 inch of four, you know, one point, one field of view at a time. And which was really cool about this is that half of this drawing was done during the summer, but the other half was done during the, during the early spring when it's rising in the east. Now, when it's rising in the east, it's at a different orientation in the eyepiece than it is during the summer when it's nearly straight up ahead. And that different orientation by itself went, oh my gosh, I never saw that before. Where, where did all this come from? I had no idea I could see any of that. And this, that's the southern blowout region. Oh my gosh. And here, this is a southeast, um, no, southeastern knot. Is what it's called. This is an area, this little smidgen here, this is where the, the blast wave of the supernova is just reaching a pre-existing cloud of dust and gas. And so it's just starting to line it, light it up. In a couple hundred years, this is going to look very different. I mean, I wish I could live that long so I could see, just, just so I could see that. So, why do I build telescopes? So I can see all this stuff. Um, I couldn't, I wouldn't have seen half of the details I've been able to if I didn't sketch. It's like I said, I my words fail me during the night because I get tired, my, my intellect shuts down. I can write fine during the day and the early evening, but you know, if you saw, if you looked at my observing notebooks, you know, you'll see my sketches and I write a few little notes. Those notes get more and more cryptic as the night goes on. It's just, it's almost funny. Um, but that that's me. I mean, other people don't. Um, yeah, and, and as I mentioned, Steve will be talking here soon about um, many of his observations. And um, his, he always has the words to describe what he's seen. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So, um, I'm interested in looking at the things that I want to see. I'm not really interested in seeing as many things as I can in the sky. I like to look for details and bright objects, as well as to try to see some dim objects that I'm interested in. Um, I'm just following my notes. I mean, I don't have a, a grand master plan. So when you see an article of mine in Sky and Telescope, it's just, that's where my nose is pointing probably a year before that article came out. Um, and, you know, that process of, of writing articles is where all these finished sketches come from. I wouldn't go to the, to the time, through the time and the technique to make these finished sketches if I wasn't going to have them published. Um, that, that's my motivation for that. If, I, if that never happened, my sketches would just live in my, my notebooks and they would mostly still be really kind of sketchy. Look, at, um, but those finished sketches are inspiring to me. I'm inspired by them. I'm inspired by what's out there and then what I can see. Um, and so really that connects me more deeply with the rest of the universe. I mean, we live in this little planet it's very nice um, for the most part. <laughs> and um, and yet to be able to see out like we can, we have a we have sometimes our atmosphere is transparent and we can see out there. 
it's just a wonderful thing. Uh, it's, it blows me away sometimes. And I'm going to end on this, this slide. Uh, this is a quote from Jennifer Willis. This is from an article that she had from the Sky and Telescope website back in 2021. And this is the very last thing in, in, in her, I think it's the very last sentence in, in her article. Uh, the night sky brought me back to myself. Now, I, that really resonates with me because there's there's been times in my life, you, you know, decades now in the past, where the only thing that kept me sane was going out at night and observing. Because that, that just helped help me put my cares and worries and all my earthly problems into a perspective that was more manageable. And sketching was a big part of, of making that more manageable because it just got me out of myself, looking out, what, what, what can I see? Um, what, is, what is in the universe that's, that I can be inspired by? And there's a, um, a, a paradox to that too, because the more I've done that, the easier it's been for me to look inside myself and so, yeah, the night sky did bring me back to myself through times of a lot of stress and trouble. And, and even now, I've, I've had a very happy life for the last 25 years. Very happy life. Every time I'm out, I'm sketching, I'm seeing what's out, out there. Um, yeah, yeah, the night sky brought me back to myself and I'm, I've been able to stay there. So thank you for your attention here and out in all you Zoomies. Uh, if there are any questions, we can take those now. Yes, Rob. Uh, you said that you cheat by locating stars prior to coming to the eyepiece. I think that's what you meant. Um, but you cheat is what you said. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I object to that. Not in that I think you shouldn't do it. I think you're doing exactly the right thing. And I don't think it's cheating. I think it's necessary, especially since you're not doing art. You're not creating an artistic impression of what you see. You're trying to document some. Mm -hmm. And um, getting the stars right is crucial to some of this stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so why not? You know, why not print them out, trace them through tracing paper? Erase the ones that you didn't actually see, if that comes to it. But it ain't it ain't cheating in this context. No way. For some people, it is. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, that's why you say their that. own problem. Yeah, yeah. For me, it isn't. No, not not at all. It saves a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, Dan. Oh um, yeah, I have another bone. Another bone to pick? Oh no. <laughs> um, you say you do this for yourself. Yeah. But think of how many people have seen your work now. I think it's so wonderful. Well, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if anybody, every, everyone out there heard what Dan said, but he just uh, gave me a one, wonderful compliment um, that I do this to my for myself. My motivation is for myself, but more, a lot of people have seen my work in the Sky and Telescope, and and that's inspiring to to people who who have seen those articles. And ah, yeah, I get email, um, not a lot of email, but I get email. Um, for almost every article, and um, and sometimes the most of the time people are expressing their their gratitude for the article in one way or another. Every so often, someone will say, "I have a bone to pick. <laughs> you made a you made a mistake on blah 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 blah," um, which is true. I've made a I've made a few mistakes in these articles, and so um, which is fine. Just another example that uh, shows I'm a human being. So, so anyway, yeah, it's yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's 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 really nice. Yes, I think there's a question here in chat. Ah, ah. Well, this is from Cindy. Cindy is going to give a, a presentation about sketching tomorrow, I believe. Uh, tomorrow or Sunday? I forget. Tomorrow. Yeah. I okay. Um, she is the um, Astronomical League's coordinator for their sketching awards. So she's really good at this. 
and she wants to know what items are in my toolkit for my finished sketches. Um, well, a lot more than just a mechanical pencil with an eraser on the end. Um, I use uh, two mechanical pencils. One is uh, HB uh, with uh, 0 0.7 millimeter lead, and the other is uh, a darker lead. And off the top of my head, I can't remember what um, the designation is. I have a series of erasers. The one I use the most is a what I call my pencil eraser. It's basically a about the about two thirds the length of a pencil, but it's all eraser inside, and you can scoot it in and out to get the length you want. And I can shape the the end um, to be as sharp or as dull as I want it to be. Um, I have a uh, um, Oh gosh, an eraser pad. It's basically a cotton bag full of eraser shavings, which is really good at getting rid of uh, smudge marks like fingerprints or just um, some light areas that some areas on the sketch that need to be lighter. So, oh, I'm, miss I'm forgetting a couple of things. Um, oh, the biggest one, which is brand new in the last year, is uh, as a Kleenex, um, and if folding a Kleenex into about a two inch by three inch square, and rubbing that on areas that I want to look nebulous, where I have very uh, sketchy looking lines, that smears out the graphite on the paper so beautifully. I don't know I'm I'm probably the last one to to come across that uh, little little technique, but it works great. Um, and yeah, so, yeah, I think that's probably the, the tools I use the most. I have others that I, I don't use, you know, I have an, an eraser template as a it's a little, about two by three inches, um, rectangular has all these different shaped openings that you can put over a drawing and then erase select areas. I don't do that because the, the shaped eraser works so well. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's some more questions here. Uh, I've heard that you'll memorize some of what you see atop the ladder to Jimmy's 48 inch and then when back on the ground draw it. Is that true? Do you not take your pad up the ladder? That is true, Scott. Um, <clears throat> and, except for very rare instances like that drawing of M77. I did have my notebook up there for the hour they gave me to, to sketch. <clears throat> um, but um, yeah, the way it works when we're at the at Jimmy's 48 inch is that there's usually three or four of us at most, and we'll take turns scrambling up his uh, 14 foot ladder. He really needs a 16 foot tall ladder because <laughs> <laughs> when it's pointing straight up, it's a little scary at the top. Um, we'll take a look, I'll come down, I'll sketch what I remember, and then I'll go back up, I'll sketch what I remember, more things that I remember. So I'll go up three or four or five times um, to to make a sketch that way. Um, if there's a lot of detail, sometimes there's not that much detail to memorize. And so I only need to go up once or twice. But it's it's a it's actually turned out to be a good technique for me in general, because, um, you know, observing with my own scopes and sketching, um, I the, the first step I do is look at the object for five, 10, 15 minutes before I start sketching. And then when I do start the sketch, then I have in my mind what it looks like really well. So I can get it down on paper fairly well and go back and forth, add details, use the eraser, blah, 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 back and forth. So, so yeah, what you've heard is correct. Um, Okay, what tools do I use to get the scale at the eyepiece same as the paper sketch if you do pre-work? Um, I use uh, my printer at home to print out a nice photograph about the scale that I want. And I have these huge pads of sketching paper. They're about, oh, I don't know, three feet by two and a half feet. And I put that photograph underneath the paper and I'll sketch the outlines of the object and I'll and I'll place the the brightest stars 
and then I'm off to uh, the races. Alternatively, if what I'm drawing is going to be really large, like that um, sketch of the uh, of the Veil Nebula, the the actual sketch is about three feet by three feet square. Um, and so what I did is I bought an art projector, printed out a tiny little photo of the Veil Nebula, put it into that projector, and it projected an image of the veil on my big piece of paper. And then I just trace that to get the general outlines and, and place the brighter stars. Um, that worked like a charm. The, the only difficulty with a really big sketch like that is that I can't scan it. I don't think there's scanners that big. Um, so I have to photograph it. And photographing the sketch is a bitch. Only because it's so hard to get the entire sketch evenly illuminated. It's so hard to get rid of a gradient. Now I could probably use, you know, astrophotography tools to do that. I just haven't taken the time to, to learn or even to find out if it's possible. Okay. Okay, another question. How do I keep my paper dry with high humidity when doing a long drying at the eyepiece? Well, um, it's a uh, it's a fight. Um, there's uh, almost every night here in Western Oregon is is dewy. Um, a couple nights ago, I was out and it wasn't dewy, and I couldn't believe it. Um, so to keep my my notebook notebook page as dry as possible, it doesn't stay completely dry. I close the close the notebook when I'm not actually you know, drawing or writing in it. And when also I, on my observing table, I have a blanket and I put that underneath the blanket to help keep it dry. So only when I'm actually doing something in the notebook do I open it. But still, sometimes the paper gets a little damp and I have to be careful. Um, and I, when, when the paper gets wet, I don't erase anything because the eraser will just rub right through the paper. So, okay. And you just get shut down at times with it's like, okay, done. <laughs> or, well, not not for observing. Um, right. For, for, for sketching, I'll just go to a, a, another page that's drier. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I, I get the, my notebooks are about five by seven and a half inch um, notebooks, you know, unlined paper They're for, for sketching. And they, they fit my hand really well. I have a really nice leather cover they fit into that I got at the um, Saturday Market in Eugene in 1980. That is hand, handmade. It's really nice. Got a matching uh, checkbook cover as well. Um, um, so it's just a matter of, um, yeah, if, if the page that's been open is too wet, I just go to the next page and, and keep going. So all, all except my very first sketching notebook are, are, are that size, five, five by seven and a half. No, it's eight and a half, excuse me, five by seven and a half, eight and a half. Um, my very first sketchbook when I was 17 um, is a big sketchbook um, that is... Uh, just cram the sketches and it's all very unorganized, but that's where I started. Okay, so that's all the questions I think here. Oh yeah, Robert. Yeah. Uh, the M7 sketch, what's the deal? What's the deal with it? So it asks if you wanna know how it works. Oh, okay, how did I do that? Okay, um, well, let's see, why don't I go back? to that sketch. There we go. All right, let's get this out of the way. Okay, so, so what I did, again, you know, I'm all my, all these finished sketches are, are drawn on really nice big sheets of tracing paper. And because I was just trying to figure this out, I came up with an idea. What I did is that after drawing all the bright stars, 
on one side of the paper. I flipped it over and made the Milky Way stars on the other side. So if I screwed it up, which I did several times, I could just erase it without erasing the stars of M7 at the same time. Mirror image. Yeah, and because it's tracing paper, then it was it was at a, I, I, I made the paper the same size as my scanner bed. So I could scan it. And so it scanned perfectly well. Those dots? These are all individual dots. Probably, I think it's 2.3 zillion. Zillion? <laughs> zillion, <laughs> yes. <laughs> did, did you use a technique where you're just like, that, 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 yeah, like, tapping, like yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that took some getting used to because a lot of the erasing I had to do is because those little, hopefully, dots were turning into little lines. Yeah, which is really easy to do. So getting getting a technique where I could just make little dots. It's also very difficult to do a random pattern. Oh. So you wind up drawing lines. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I there was so much erasing going on. <laughs> Every one of them is accurate to the RA. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're they're precisely in the right right location. No. <laughs> I was using Jay Howard. <laughs> yeah. So so anyway, so that that's the deal there, and that's um, yeah. So I was uh, really happy with the way that worked out. In fact, um, that article that this sketch appeared in was the first time. I didn't have an actual photograph of the object as part of the article. This, the, the inverted version of this image was the lead image of the article. Because I, when I when I was putting it together, before I sent it in, I had, had them both in there, a photograph and the sketch, and it was like, now they're too close together. You know, there's just not enough difference there to really warrant having both. So I said, okay, I'll just go with the sketch and see what, uh, my editor says, <laughs> and she went for it. So, okay, let's do a time check here. 544. All right. So that means, okay, that means there's, I went really quick. That's fine. So why don't we just um, call it good for here. I'll stop my share. And... Let's see, we'll come back in about 15 minutes and hear Steve's presentation. And I'm trying to see if I can stop. And I'll stop the live stream. And I can't stop the Zoom recording there. Let's see. Yeah, so good time to take a bathroom break, get a snack. And we'll be back in business in 14 minutes. Oh, there we go. Okay, there's Steve. We'll get the uh, recordings going again here. Let's take a minute to get the YouTube live stream. Okay, YouTube is getting, there we go. Okay, YouTube is going. Okay. So. Okay. So can you uh, share your screen, Steve? Um. Okie doke. Let's see. Okay, very good. All right, now before you get going, I'm going to introduce you. And my goal in this introduction is to make you blush. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see how successful I am. So Steve Gottlieb, if you don't know, you should know. Um, he is, in my estimation, 
um, the preeminent visual observer of our age. Um, he has visually seen and described all NGC objects and most and maybe all the icy objects by now. We were closing in on them um, a year ago. And um, he, he I, I alluded to him during my presentation about how he can use words the way I, I sketch, because his descriptions are, are so detailed and so good. If you um, if you get the the Nexus uh, digital setting circles, his descriptions are in as part of that software of that device. So if you bring up the description of an object, that's his description from his observations. Um, he's also a great guy, and I'm lucky to call him a friend. We go out to visit our, our friend, our mutual friend Jimmy Lowry in West Texas. Um, uh, usually at least once a year, sometimes twice. And um, it's a uh, it's a real treat, a rare treat to be able to do that with with people like Steve and Jimmy, who who we all get so excited. We're like little kids with that big telescope under a dark West Texas sky. And um, yeah, um, if you go to the uh, Golden State Star Party in Northern California, which is usually held in June. Um, you will be able to meet Steve, with, and he has his 24-inch uh, star structure telescope. Uh, Jimmy Lowry is there. Of course, he leaves his 48-inch at home, um, but he's there, and we just have a great time observing the Northern California early summer sky. Um, and so... With no further ado, I don't think that was very embarrassing. I couldn't think okay. of anything embarrassing okay. to say. Sorry, Steve. Um, so why don't you take it away? And uh, here we go. Okay. Is my audio coming okay through? Okay. I think you're muted. Okay. Uh -oh. oh, you know, it could be an R end. Hold, no, hold on. You're, you're coming through okay. <laughs> Okay, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me, Alan? Yes, we can now. Okay. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, I think Howard was a little over generous in his introduction, but I'll, I'll take it. Um, I think my talk will be a uh, sort of a good bookend to Howard's talk because we have uh, very different approaches, I guess, um, to amateur astronomy, um, Howard through telescope making. I've never built a telescope uh, um, at all, uh, Howard, is the uh, consummate sketcher, um, other than some chicken scratches I sometimes do with the eyepiece. Uh, I don't do any sketching at all. Um, but what I've always done from the very beginning is uh, take observing notes. And I've always been very um, organized in that manner. And uh, I've kept my observing notes, my log books. I'll show you one of them pretty soon um, from the very beginning, the beginning <laughs> going back uh, 47 years. And um, just like Howard has his early sketches, I have my, all my early notes also. Um, of course, at one point uh, when I first got a uh, personal computer, in the late uh, 1980s, I entered all my notes, which was a humongous task in the uh, computer into a spreadsheet, I believe, because um, at that point I had um, thousands of observations. And um, not only did I want my notes, but I wanted to include uh, coordinates and magnitude and uh, sizes and all kinds of other information about the objects. 
Sometimes those weren't easily available. Um, I guess one advantage I did have over a lot of amateurs in the pre-internet age though is I did was a grad student at UC Berkeley and lived close to UC Berkeley. And so I had access to the astronomy department and oh boy, in the astronomy de department, uh, they, besides all of the uh, catalogs uh, that were not generally available to amateurs and certainly weren't uh, digitized unless they were available perhaps on uh, microfiche, um, I had access to the sky surveys, the Palomar Sky Survey, uh, the ESO Sky Survey and all that. And I spent many, many hours in the, uh, in the uh, reading room in the graduate astronomy library uh, before the internet age. So uh, let me just mention a little bit more about uh, getting started. I uh, basically got into astronomy in the mid to late uh, uh, 1970s um, and found a uh, 60 millimeter refractor that was uh, sitting in my girlfriend father's girlfriend's father's uh, garage uh, gathering dust and I borrowed that for a year and after that I got my sort of first real telescope which is a six inch and uh, six inch Edmund reflector and I've had a variety of telescopes uh, none of them homemade um, an eight inch I'll probably forget one of them, but in 10 inch, um, a 13.1 inch, that was an Odyssey, one, a 17.5 inch, that was a Odyssey two. Those were the first two large Dobsonians that were generally available for purchase. An 18 inch and a 24 inch. And um, as my, as a telescope uh, size grew, uh, I was kind of interested in observing always whatever was out there at the edge of visibility in those telescopes. And that necessitated finding a lot of observing projects. Now, once you get beyond the Messier objects and I guess maybe go to the Herschel 400, um, well, there are plenty of observing programs from the Astronomical League, but I, I always kind of liked making my own observing projects. And um, fortunately, with the larger telescopes and particularly nebula filters that uh, came on the market in the early 1980s, that was just a dream come true. So. Let me just uh, show you, um, let's see. This is my current telescope. Uh, and I think Howard maybe had a shot at the Golden State Star Party. This is my uh, 24 inch before a lot of people have arrived. Usually Howard is set up next to me. Um, and you can see people uh, set up with their campers or trailers uh, nearby and uh, I'm getting ready for a nighttime of observing. So what, what observing projects are we talking about? Well, I'll try to um, give you sort of a variety of projects that I've um, taken to heart and uh, will go through at a star party, pick, pick one or two projects and work, at the, work on them at a particular star party. Um, I think Howard certainly also mentioned Jimmy's telescope, and we've both spent a lot of time observing with him. Here's another view of that telescope, and I'm up on the uh, ladder. You can get a sense of it above the walls of the observatory. It's a roll-off roof observa observatory. You can already see I'm getting up towards the top of the ladder, and the telescope's probably not pointed at more than uh, 40 degrees. So one, 
once you get up above 60 degrees, I'm on the top uh, step of that ladder. Um, so when I talk about recording observations, Howard is usually sitting at the table next to me. He's sketching and I'm taking notes. Uh, as he mentioned, he usually comes down from the ladder, starts sketching an object. I go up there and uh, take looks through the telescope for a couple of minutes, come down to our table next to sitting, I'll be sitting seated next to him and I'll start taking notes on the objects. Now, this is, I kind of pulled out some, just a sample of old notes to show you I do keep them. And these, the, actually these notes actually are from 1994 at a, at a place in the Sierra foothills called Fiddletown. So they're actually only what, uh, I guess 30 years old. Um, this was one page from a whole pad I have and I have notes go all my notes going back uh, throughout the 80s that look something like this. And um, so this is not through Jimmy's telescope. This is through one of my telescopes, probably my uh, 17 and a half inch. Um, and these were taken just seated, seated at a table. Uh, I was observing uh, I'm not even going to talk about this project, but this was observing um, uh, faint stellar planetaries uh, discovered by uh, Kohotek uh, and uh, Carl Hennies. And uh, you can, I'll just kind of, I don't know if you can read this or not, but because um, sometimes I will use uh, shorthand or abbreviations, but the first object is K326. And I wrote, yes, why? Because I didn't know if it was going to be visible. No one had ever reported an observation. Uh, appears without filter as a very faint 15th magnitude, quote unquote, star. It's not a star. It's a planetary. Identified with a finder chart. What was I using as finder charts? Well, I had printouts. Uh, using a program that basically plotted the guide star catalog. Um, I don't even think it plotted deep sky objects, just the guide star catalog, and um, identified it with a finder chart. And uh, I wrote that it was located one to one and a half arc minutes west of a 12.5 magnitude star. And um, I guess in the guide star catalog, it was called 11.9. And I wrote it had a good contrast gain, blinking with an O3 filter. Uh, that's one important thing I always look for with planetary nebulas is what kind of, um, how many magnitudes of contrast gain you might get with a filter. Um, but with the O3 filter, I could tell it was a very small disk, evenly lit. And I wrote it slightly fainter than a mag 14.8 star. So estimate, I can read my handwriting, I'm sure better than you. I estimated as mag 15.0 to 15.2. Um, and then I boxed first visual sighting. Now, I, I, when I don't mean my visual sighting, I was, I, I'm projecting that it's possible that this was the first ever visual sighting. Why? Well, I don't think that at this point there was very many amateurs that were observing this type of this type of an object. I checked. I, I wrote below it. I'm reading no JM. That refers to Jack Marling, who, like me, was interested in observing all these objects, and he hadn't observed it yet. And then I checked with K KW which is Kent Wallace, he was also observing all these and he reported a negative observation. So I kind of uh, guessed or assumed that it might be the first ever visual observation. Uh, don't know, but if anyone else had observed it previous, they certainly hadn't reported it up to that point or even up to now. 
And you can see I have notes on a couple of other planetaries. Um, K416, again, a yes. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I didn't pick it up at 220 power uh, without a filter. But once I put in the L3 filter, I wrote once seen with a filter, I can see it for moments even without a filter, taking it out. So these are the kind of notes I took. These were all taken right after observing the telescope. And on that night, I probably took notes like this on 30 or 40 objects throughout the night. Okay, now this was 1994. So at that point, uh, I, did have a, I did have a computer for a number of years and I was organized and keeping my notes uh, electronically uh, entered. So after I got home, I probably would verify the observation and enter it in the computer. Uh, okay, um, I thought I, I actually added this slide after I saw Howard's uh, presentation <laughs> because um, this has us both, not at the night uh, he talked about with Ron uh, Buddha, but uh, Howard and I a few years earlier uh, basically had a night uh, on the 82 inch that, um, was essentially, was just us two and uh, the telescope operator. And uh, the reason was because there was a public viewing for employees earlier in the night. And um, that ended around 11 or 11, 11, 11 o'clock, maybe 11.15 or so. And uh, the telescope operator, who was a friend we both knew, gave us a phone call and said, why don't you come up? there's nobody using the telescope, it's yours. So um, we had quite a good time. This photo actually was not taken like during the daytime, but was taken early in the morning. We, uh, it was totally dark, but we turned the lights on inside the observatory to, to take the photo. You can kind of see I'm still wearing, uh, we're still wearing our nighttime jackets and I have a cap on. Okay, so let me give go through some observing projects now that I've uh, participated in uh, and have spent a lot of time on. And just like Howard, my observing projects and notes have translated into, generally have translated into Sky Intel articles, a few of them in other magazines some prior to Sky and Tell, like uh, Deep Sky Magazine, <clears throat> and some other ones like uh, Astronomy Magazine. But Able Planetaries was an article I wrote in uh, Sky and Tell. And this is a photo of George Abel. George worked on the uh, famous Palomar Sky Survey uh, when it took place in the early 1950s. He was only a grad student at Caltech at the time that photo was taken. And he was responsible. One of the, I think two assistants was responsible for taking images and also examining the plates afterwards to see if they, they were in good condition, good shape, didn't include any um, streaks or perhaps uh, any, any meteors went through the field, that type of thing, so that they would have to be um, redone. And in 1955, he published a list of 73 planetaries. He recorded these as he was examining the field. He started taking notes on them um, as he was looking at the plates. He was really the first ones to look at, uh, one of the first people to look at the plates, if not the first. And um, he made a second catalog in 1966 that included 88 plan 86 planetaries known as Abel 1 through Abel 86. And a lot of these are lar very large, highly evolved planetaries with low surface brightness. Now, 
And that's the key why they weren't found earlier visually. They had been missed by the Herschels and others who were observing generally with higher power, small fields of view, and they had low surface brightness. The key was in 1980, the first O3 filter came out. Uh, maybe even there was, I think, uh, another filter, Daystar 300, that came out even a little earlier, 79 or 78. But Lumicon started um, manufacturing, manufacturing O3 filters, and that really changed the game as far as observing able planetary nebula. So here's just a couple of examples. This is these, this is a one of the brighter able planetaries, uh, able thirty nine in Hercules. That's a, a three arc minute, fair pretty pretty large size, for a planetary, a perfect spherical bubble, about fifty five hundred light years away, with a mag fifteen seven central star. You can also see it has a, a limb brightening. Uh, that doesn't really mean three-dimensionally, it's brighter on the edge. We're, we're looking at it as it projected on the sky. So as we look at it, we're looking through thicker material on the edge, and that's why it appears brighter. This object is visible with an O3 filter, even in an eight inch, and um, it's visible unfiltered in an 18 inch. I thought you might like to see some of my notes. Um, I can go through these slowly or um, quickly. I've taken notes on ABLE 39 eight times. They're kept all uh, in my, well, it's actually a database. And I'm just showing you four of them. This one goes back to 1985. I think this was my second observation of it. And um, again, wow. I didn't enter the observation until later. Uh, I don't know. No, I wasn't going to play it. Probably did the way to Well, this is likely. I'm just using my nails to scrape it. I was going to Everyone, turn off your microphones except Steve, please. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Howard. So I can. Uh, well, this is like I've been cleaning. Just so you can. Well, that means um, everybody, please check I your. I got something cooking in the oven, so I don't want to. So the horn is nice, nice, nice. Okay, well, let's see. So, yeah, Dan, you need to be muted. Here you go. Thank you. Okay. So my notes, this was, again, my notes weren't that sophisticated back in 1985. I just simply called it faint, fairly large round. But I did note I could hold it steadily with averted vision using an O3 filter. And I also checked it with a different filter, a Daystar 300 filter. It's not available nowadays, but it's basically a narrowband filter similar to a UHC filter. Um, then I observed it, well, not the second time, but I observed it another time in 1998 uh, with my 17 and a half inch. And this time it was visible continuously with direct vision. And um, I could tell now it was slightly brighter along the eastern edge of the planetary. And it was visible unfiltered at 100x. Um, and I also noted some stars were superimposed. 18 inch, I still observed, if not much difference in aperture, but I still observed it again because Maybe the conditions were slightly better. I was observing at a darker site. Um, whatever the case was, I, this time I was able to note that there was a couple of slightly brighter arc segments when I left, let the planetary drift through the field. Again, all these notes were taken directly after the observation, not when I got home, kind of like Howard might do in terms of finishing a sketch. Of course, I. Of course, I used abbreviations when I was taking notes, and I just expanded those when I got home. Um, then here's an observation with my current scope with, a, with my 24 inch, 
which I've had for a while. You can see the observation was made on July 7th, 2013. Um, now I noted the 15 or 15 and a half magnitude central star, um, which should have been a vi visible in my 18 or 17 and a half inch. I'm not sure why it wasn't. I have a feeling it's because I did not use I didn't I didn't look at the planetary uh, without a filter at high enough power to see the central star. Um, and I also could tell with using um, 125x with a UHC filter that the planetary was clearly annular. And I also noted uh, there was an also a faint galaxy not far off, 12 arc minutes to the east northeast. So these are, this is an example of four observations that I've made. Seems a little ridiculous. Not that many people would observe one object uh, eight times, perhaps. Though this was the first observation, or the second one was in 1985. So what we're talking about over a 40-year period. So it's not eight times over 40 years uh, isn't, I'm not observing it that often. Here's another kind of cool planetary, really cool, Abel 70, um, which is again, relatively bright. Um, what makes this object pretty unique is there's a background galaxy, that little streak on the top of the image is a background galaxy shining through the planetary at a distance from a distance of 250 million light years. In other words, it's 10,000 times as distant as Abel 70. What an amazing depth of field. Think about that. You're looking at two objects on top of each other, 10,000 times difference in distance from us. It's also a very rare central star that uh, is barium rich binary. Uh, the white dwarf, which is ionized the shell of the planetary um, when it was in the uh, AGB phase, asymptotic giant branch phase, it polluted the main sequence star with uh, heavy elements, including barium. I think there's only a couple of planet central stars of planetaries where that's the case. And there is a weak ring visually. Sometimes um, I've only seen, and some scopes may just show the brightening at the edge of the ring, and it looks like a diamond ring in that case. Again, here's three examples of notes. I actually I want to do some one or a couple of notes with the 14 and a half inch. So this is actually from 2021, more recently. Um, I picked it up unfiltered, um, but then I looked with an 03 filter at 87X and 140, and uh, it was visible continuously as a nice disc. I couldn't really see the galaxy as a real galaxy um, extended out beyond the edge of the planetary but I could see the north edge was brighter due to the galaxy. Uh, with my 17 and a half, I'm going back to 2001. Um, now the galaxy again was visible as a brighter knot, but if I was look carefully, I could see this, in, I'm reading here, this enhancement is elongated west, northwest, east, southeast, perhaps 15 seconds by eight seconds. How did I know which way it was elongated? Very simply, uh, the telescope was drifting through my field of view. So it was very obvious which way west was and uh, west-northwest was just meant it was tilted a little bit down. Uh, and so that was just an estimate. Uh, I also noted a couple of nearby stars and, um, that was about it. Uh, with my 24 inch, now uh, the, the planetary I could tell was um, 
had a darker center and a brighter rim, so it looked annular. The galaxy was an obvious brighter streak, and um, I really looked like a galaxy. And did I see anything else? Well, using uh, 375 power now, the galaxy actually dominated the planetary at a high enough, well, this is unfiltered. Now, uh, now the galaxy itself was the first thing or the main thing I noticed the planetary itself at that a little higher power started the surface brightness started decreasing and the galaxy was still small enough high surface brightness enough to actually be a little bit more prominent by the way I, let me just mention again this one <laughs> i see i've had i took notes i looked beforehand to see how many times i had observed it when i copied these notes and I have observations 11 different times for Abel 70. Here's George Abel a little bit older, as you can tell. And um, this is when he was at UCLA. After, uh, after finishing the pause, he got a position there. Um, and he, re he, re he became a professor um, at UCLA, in fact, he was, he was head of the astronomy department um, when I was a student at UCLA uh, in the late 1960s. Um, he wrote his PhD dissertation on the distribution of rich galaxy clusters. And prior to the Palomar Sky Survey, there was really only a few dozen rich clusters that were known. Um, the Coma Berenices galaxy cluster, for example, the Hercules galaxy cluster. And there was a few more distant clusters that were known, but only a few dozen were known up until that point. But the Palomar Sky Survey just revealed thousands of galaxy clusters. And he produced a 1958 paper, a study on 2,712 rich galaxy clusters that he cataloged on the Palomar Sky Survey. And he also determined um, their size, uh, how many galaxies, how rich they were, and estimated their distance based on how bright the 10th, mag 10th brightest galaxy in the cluster was. Just want to highlight a couple of able galaxy clusters, particularly ones I've written Sky and Tell articles about. This one, Howard, I believe, had his own sketch of. And it may be this sketch right here. I think I probably just have a little wider view because I believe my, I believe Howard's sketch was in my the article I wrote on the Hercules galaxy cluster. This is 500 million light years away. Still, it can be really explored with a 10 or 12 inch in that range. A lot of the bright, many of the brighter NGC and IC galaxies are visible. Um, it's a little bit of an unusual cluster because there's not one bright central galaxy. I'll show you an image of a cluster later where, there, where that's the case. Um, and many can be seen uh, several, a couple of fields away from this particular Howard sketch. Um, I've logged 36 in an 18 inch and in Lowry's 48 inch, um, I've checked off and taken notes in one eyepiece field of 22 members. On the very bottom of that Howard sketch, you'll notice I circled uh, a galaxy, IC 1178, and there's a little smudge just to its lower left. Okay, just at the bottom of the screen inside the yellow circle. Well, the, the little smudge next to IC 1178 happens to be 1181. And, um, Turns out that 
that was one of the galaxies that we looked at together with um, Ron uh, Buddha when he wanted to sketch some members of, of the Hercules galaxy cluster. So I thought I would show my notes here. The 17 and a half, I just called it faint. I know that's a pretty vague term, but faint, small, round, bright core. Sometimes that's all you can see, particularly on these um, able galaxy clusters. I did see that it was a close pair though. In my 24 inch, it was a little brighter, of course, and it was sharply concentrated, meaning there was a, a very small high surface brightness core with a much lower surface brightness halo. It's actually an ARP pair. I'll talk about ARP galaxies a little later. Uh, there was also a nearby PGC galaxy that was a dim edge on. And I actually took notes, I don't know if Howard knows this, on the with the 82 inch with Ron, this was in on May 6. Um, and I called it, uh, again, there was a strong concentration uh, with an intensely bright, very small nucleus, a very diffuse outer halo, perhaps tidal debris, because this is an interacting pair, extends north, extending to the, the diameter to about 45 arc seconds, I estimated. And the companion, I see 1181, which in smaller telescopes, just a dim glow, I could see a faint diffuse tidal tail on the east end that swept to the south, bending slightly west. So any time I have an opportunity to take notes, I do. <laughs> um, here's that Able 2065 that Howard also talked about. Um, this is the SDSS Sloan Digital Sky Survey image with 400 members. Again, I wrote a Sky and Tell article um, on this cluster. I was so thrilled to observe it because Burnham's, which was one of my first uh, sources of data early on, Burnham's Celestial Handbook, wrote, it was, this is a quote, this cluster is, it had an image which totally captured my imagination. Unfortunately, he called it far beyond the reach of the usual amateur telescope. And even more recently, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada handbook calls it perhaps the most difficult object for amateur scopes. Well, it is at a distance of almost a billion light years. So based on Burnham's uh, comment, I was thrilled Oh, I don't know, this is going back 35 years. I was thrilled when I was able to log six members, probably the brightest six smudges you see in that image, six members in my 17 and a half inch. And that sort of inspired me to write an article. More recently, I've actually gone up there with an image like this and checked off and taken even slight small notes at the eyepiece. I guess Scott Harrington asked about this. In this case, I did bring an image up to the eyepiece and checked off because I wanted to make sure I was seeing the actual galaxies that I was checking. Um, 40, 43 of them I checked off in one single field in the 48 inch. There's been a lot of other uh, catalogs that have been based on the Palomar uh, Sky Survey, the first Palomar Sky Survey. One is Abel's Palomar Globulars, which were 15 globulars found by Abel, Albert Wilson and himself, another uh, Caltech um, astronomer on the Palomar Sky Survey, though only 13 of them were are actually new because two of them had been discovered uh, previously, one by William Herschel. And then in the late 1960s, an Armenian astronomer, that's who's in this image here, uh, uh, Terzon discovered 11 globular clusters on red sensitive plates. And they had been previously 
missed because they were highly reddened due to uh, dust in the plane of the Milky Way. In fact, this was another article on the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy that I wrote. Two of those tears on galaxy, I'm sorry, globulars are uh, were captured or deposited from the Sagittari Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, which is currently um, merging with the Milky Way. Here's one example. This is Palomar 8, uh, which George Abel found in the early 1950s. And um, looks kind of dim, but in an 18 inch, perhaps even smaller telescope, um, I, I've resolved a dozen stars in that globular, taking notes on it. And I find this globular, I, one reason I picked this globular was um, I've had access to E.E. E. Barnard's logbooks at Lick Observatory in San Jose and gone through all his logbooks carefully and found that he actually made a visual discovery of this planetary in 1889 with a 12 inch refractor, unfortunately, and even said it was likely a globular cluster. This is with a 12 inch. Um, unfortunately, he never published the discovery. Uh, why? <laughs> well, um, his main interests at that point were uh, observing comets and planets and um, a lot of his discoveries, dozens of his discoveries, he never published, uh, unfortunately. Again, that turned into a Sky and Tell article uh, on Barnard's unknown uh, discoveries. Here's a Terzon globular. This is certainly not the way it looks visually in any telescope. That's a Hubble image. Um, this is a highly reddened globular looking towards the center of the Milky Way. I think it's projected just a couple of degrees from the actual center of the Milky Way. And so a little, it's over 20,000 light years from us. So you're looking through a lot of dust in the direction of the center. And it's only a couple thousand light years from the um, actual core of the Milky Way. And uh, this, is, this is visible in an 18 inch. It's a tough object and it is, partially resolvable in the 48 inch. Uh, let's go on to a few other uh, projects. Some of them are for large telescopes, some for smaller telescopes. Um, I should mention, even with whether we're talking about uh, Terzon globulars or ring galaxies, you're often not gonna, you're never gonna see the image some of these images on, of course, on uh, taken with the Hubble um, or the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Sometimes you're just, often you're just pleased just to glimpse the object at all, and that's all you can do. Still, that's a lot of fun to track it down and knowing what the object is, knowing what it's all about, that's what makes it satisfying. So there's various types of rings, just, Collision, there's collisional rings, polar rings, HOAG rings, empty rings. Most of them are targets for large telescopes. Um, Mayall's object, that's an ARP. I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, that's uh, a collisional ring. You can see one galaxy passing right through the center of another one. And the middle one is a empty, ring, Sevens Wiki 466. This probably is like Mayall's object, but at a later stage where the galaxy has moved away already. And the last one is a polar ring galaxy. You can kind of see a ring going around it vertically that almost looks like an edge on Saturn. And that's, that actually it's funny because Saturn right now looks, the rings look edge on almost. Um, this is a galaxy in Centaurus. Unfortunately, it's too far south to view from uh, the U.S., the continental U.S., um, but it's a beautiful object. Uh, VV are uh, Boris 
uh, Vorontsov Elyaminov was a Russian astronomer. He used the POS to uh, make a catalog of 350 interacting galaxies. Many of these are deformed pairs, and that inspired Halton Arp to come up with his catalog of peculiar galaxies. Here's an example of one of his interacting galaxies, the Taffy galaxies. These are UGC galaxies, 12-12914, that's the one on the right, 12915 on the left. They were, they collided about 20 million years ago, and they're still connected by a gas bridge that resembles strands of taffy, particularly on radio um, maps. And that's how it got its name. The spiral arms are visible in a larger um, telescope. Uh, in my 18 and 24, you can just sort of see the beginnings of them. In the uh, even larger telescopes, I have some notes where comparing three different apertures, 17, 24, and 48. Um, with my 24 inch, I could just see um, a spiral arm attached to UG, the, what, the galaxy that's on the right, that's hooking towards the one on the left. And uh, also the one on the left had a short extension or arm but in the 48 inch, the, the arms were bright and curving and nearly attached to each other, um, almost in an embrace, I wrote, but they didn't quite connect. This was observed in 2013. Here's another coalescing pair. Um, again, observed it even with my, even in an eight inch, this was in 2019. Just to show you, not all of these require a large aperture, uh, 17 and a half and 24. Uh, with an eight inch, I just saw a single ghostly patch. With the larger apertures, I could see um, individual galaxies uh, were resolved, even though they're pretty close together, 16 arc seconds. Um, and so they need higher power to resolve them. Sometimes I'll record the SQM readings, the uh, surface brightness uh, of the sky uh, in magnitudes per square uh, arc second. And with a 24 inch, it was 21.72 at the time. Uh, ARP's galaxy, a lot of amateurs are familiar with the with ARP and his at, Atlas of Peculiar Galaxy. That's 338 individual galaxies and groups. So there's a lot in there to keep you busy. I love observing ARPs. Some of them, they're faint and you just want to detect them. Other ones, they're challenging um, to detect structure. Uh, so lots of fun. This is an example, ARP81. This is an NGC. In fact, it's two NGCs. What makes it really special is it discovered by a 14-year-old, the son of Lewis Swift, Edward Swift, um, who observed with his father in 1885. And it has a one-sided on the east tidal tail, which is pretty unusual. Those two smashed blobs on top of each other are the two galaxies. And there's kind of a blue knot right in between those two smashed blobs. That's a superstar cluster. And all this structure is visible in a 48 inch. Uh, here's another one um, that I wrote about when I was writing about um, galaxies, colliding galaxies in a Sky and Tell article, the Penguin and Egg, which is ARP 142. Um, and in this case, you can see the penguin, that blue galaxy, kind of above the oval, the egg, and the blue galaxy is a distorted spiral uh, that's overlaid with silhouetted dust lanes. Quite an amazing image with um, blue streaming um, 
uh, st new, newly formed stars, star clusters uh, in the neck of the penguin. Here's one last ARP, which is the antennae galaxy. And um, this is a mashup of two gas-rich spirals. You can see these are little dots. This is Howard's sketch, which he lent me through to use, uh, I believe in the article. And this was, he made this with a 90 inch Bach telescope. And all those little dots are H2 star forming regions. And many of those are visible um, in a large telescope. Uh, I've counted 15 of them in the 48 inch. And of course that's observing knots and features inside galaxies. That's a whole nother, um, that's a whole nother topic. I just wanna maybe do one more um, project. I can keep going on and on and I'll, I'll also wanna show you some of my notes. So I'm gonna stop on this. Um, this is Igor Karinchensev. Um, he and his and Valentina, his wife, in 1970s, late 1970s, uh, came up with a catalog based on the POS of 84 isolated triplets. So they're not rich groups; they're just trios. And all the galaxies are 16th magnitude photographic. That means they're probably 15th magnitude visual or brighter. And he also came up with a separate catalog of Southern galaxies, 76 additional triplets. And I've gone through every one of those 84 as an observing art, as an observing project and um, wrote a Sky and Tell article on them. This is one example, this is KTG, um, Karachinsev triplet group 29. These three galaxies, that's, that's a um, image from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Those are crammed into, that's an interacting triplet crammed into 1.3 arc minutes, kind of a, the size of a small galaxy, all three of them, and um, needed 375 power to resolve that close pair. Um, I, so, I think what I'm gonna do, I can keep going on. This is flat galaxies. That was another article. Um, but I think what I'd like you to like to do um, since we're, um, I'm running a little long here is I think I want to um, see if I can uh, go over and show you my observing uh, let's see if I can do this. Let me see if I can. I'm going to. I'm going to change my sharing to my notes for a minute. Okay. So, where do I keep my notes? So, you can see here. I. I may have. Seems like changing this may have frozen my video, but that's okay. You can hear me, Howard, or not? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'm just going to continue and just finish this. Okay. So, so you can see my note. This, I know you can't see this. It's too, too small. It's filling my uh, screen right now, which is a fairly large monitor. This right here, which was, sort of looks like a spreadsheet, are notes on literally 20, I'm reading this on the bottom here, 23,819 objects that I've observed, okay? These are all my notes. Now, within a particular note here, within a particular object here, um, I may have observed that object multiple times. So, I don't know if you, you may not be able to see this, but I just opened up a little window in my, um, 
looks like, again, a spreadsheet. It's really a database. And I have notes for that object from 1997, 2005, 2013, 2014, okay? Now, so what, what, what can I do with this? I have multiple fields that I keep track of. I have the name of the object, the type of the object, the aliases of the object, uh, type, uh, type of object, if it's a galaxy or whatever, RA deck, size, position angle, magnitude, surface brightness, constellation, dates that I observed it, NGC description, uh, William Herschel designation, John Herschel designation, date it was discovered, historical information, this object right here, uh, I don't know if I can pick a, a better one um, here, but uh, I have information about when it was discovered, who discovered it, et cetera, uh, including their original description. So this, I, I opened up a window that has an object Hersch, William Herschel discover, and I have his original discovery notes. And then I have, of course, all of my notes, like I said. And in finally, in addition, if I wanna select a certain class of objects, um, for example, I might wanna select all my ARPs. So I can very easily um, select either name contains ARP or uh, aliases contain ARP. And I'll just, now I have on this, well, you can't see all of them. I'd have to scroll up and down, but I have 676 objects that have ARP designations on the screen right now. They're all sorted by RA, but perhaps I want to sort them by constellation. Well, I just select the field that's the constellation field and go here. And I simply now can, you can kind of see I've got them all Andromeda's at the top, Aquarius. I've now got them sorted by constellation. So it's very easy for me to find things and I can write print out reports very easily of the objects, specific objects in any format I want, you know, within the database. So I think I'm going to stop at this point. I think I've actually gone right up to seven o'clock. And I don't know if at this point, if um, people want to log out, I understand if anyone wants to ask any questions at this point, I'd be very willing to uh, answer questions. I may want to see if I can take a second and unfreeze my video, Howard. Sure. But let me just see what happens here. Uh, let me go back and let me see if okay, am I back on? Yes, yeah, we can see you now. Okay. So um, let me stop the share, I guess. Okay. I do that. Yep. Uh, I have the first question too. Okay. Actually, more of a, of a request. Um, when we observe together um, at Jimmy's on the 48 inch, you always have this three ring binder. Right. You have all these printouts that have, um, you know, black on white images of, of, of all different kinds of, uh, of objects. And most of them have notes that you've written on from previous observations. Could you talk about how you go about organizing that type of thing before you go out to observe? Well, it's funny. With Jimmy, I have actually a large, I don't know what it is, a um, three-inch binder filled with images and charts just for the 48 inch, because there's things I'm gonna look for in his telescope, of course, 
that I know I'm not going to see either in my 14 and a half inch or 18 inch or 24 inch. And so that that one notebook that I may bring is just dedicated to him. Now, depending on what season we go there, what month, I'll take out a subset of those charts and put them in a smaller binder. So it's I'm not taking the real large one, you know, won't fit in my backpack very easily. But sometimes there are objects that I've observed before. I think that's what you're referring to, you know, either in his telescope or perhaps my telescope. And after afterwards, you know, I don't have a laptop there. Neither one of us, we have, Jimmy has his laptop, but we're not um, looking at images as we, as you, as you sketch it, or I take notes. But when I go home, I'll compare my uh, notes with an image on the screen. And I will see if there's any features that I perhaps missed when the, you know, when I when, when when I observed it, you know, a few days earlier at his house. Sometimes that might just be the next day when we're sitting around. I'll look at an image and say, whoa, there's a little knot up here. I didn't realize that that I missed. And so I'll 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 put a little um, circle or arrow at that particular feature, and then the next I'll want to I'll want to go back and observe that object again, just to look for that one or two specific features, even though I've looked at the object before. Not sure if that answers your question a little bit, but yeah, but you yeah it does. But what I was really getting at was how do you decide which or which objects you're going to go to that level of detail on? Well, God, as you probably, it's not too hard because as you know, with his telescope, I'd probably say any galaxy brighter than about 12th magnitude or 13th magnitude is gonna show spiral structure and knots, et cetera. Um, but basically we seem to all love observing uh, art, you know, very, very similar objects, you know, ARP galaxies that have unusual morphology, um, sometimes are thin edge on galaxies and ring galaxies. All, so a lot of, and, and, and I particularly like observing uh, galaxy groups. So I'm always trying to find some really faint Hickson group. I've tried observing all of them with my 18 and 24 inch Hickson compact groups, but I might have only seen one or two members in, in the 18 or 24 inch. And I and there's say there's five of them uh, that Hickson with Hickson de designations. I didn't get to Hickson, which actually Hickson compact groups was actually the first uh, article I wrote for Sky and Tell um, back in, I think, 1999. And I want to try to observe every single member of every single Hickson group. And that's the scope to do it in. <laughs> so that's what I'm sometimes doing um, when I'm going back to a Hickson. OK, so I, I, I have another question. I know there are others. I'm just going to ask it because I'm here. Um, you write some unbelievably detailed observing reports that goes on the uh, the TAC email list and that end up on the uh, Adventures in Deep Space website. Right. And that's, that, where I have, that's where I have all my notes also. Yes, and that looks like an enormous amount of, of time and work goes into those. Fortunately, uh, fortunately like you, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that helps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, they're, they're all very, very wonderful. So are there questions here? Yes, there is a question, Rob. Yeah, I might have just gotten the answer, which was what, what's gonna become of the Gottlieb database? Um, is, what's your future plans for it? And, and I guess it exists online, right? Well, part of it exists online. Well, I think I showed you, I have notes. I, it, a little bit of an exaggeration. Uh, I have, I do have notes on 23,000 objects in my database. I think a little bit of an exaggeration because I, at, from home, 
I have some more pedestrian projects like observing double stars. And so I have uh, that 23,000, I think includes something like 3,000 uh, double or multiple stars. And I, I'm not really into variables that much. So it's maybe uh, 20,000 deep sky objects that I have notes on. I'm not sure exactly. I might have online um, something like uh, 12 to 14,000 objects. I, I'd have to look. So they're not all online, but um, I am planning to put them all online. I could. Um, I have to just sort of figure out how to organize them the best. But I think the next time I do an update, which should be pretty soon, I think I'll put a whole some new classes of objects, whether it's planetary nebulae, um, emission nebulae, sharpless nebulae, dark nebulae, something I haven't done before. So I do plan to keep increasing that, um, uh, my notes online. Okay. Yeah, and you're you're are you getting more into sharpless objects because of night vision device? Yes, but I've also, perhaps like you, I do have notes on quite a few sharpless. You know, when we had to when we viewed them, you know, with filters with a uh, an O3 filter or UHC filter. So um, now I sort of have notes on quite a few of them with both actually. Um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, that is that is the case. Um, I'm doing the, as Howard kind of knows, besides the double stars, I'm kind of doing um, night vision observing uh, with at home, at my light polluted backyard where there's really nothing much I can do in terms of deep sky observing. Okay, so we have a couple of uh, questions on chat. Yeah. Uh, I see. Uh, do you have a red flashlight you prefer? And do you hold it in your mouth or set it on the page? Take it, you have your pad sitting on the table next to you. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, red flashlights, ah, uh, the bane of amateur astronomers. <laughs> either they're, either they, break or uh, they're too bright. Um, I don't, you know, whatever red flashlight I've had, I usually have found that I needed to um, dim it by uh, diffusing, diffusing the light somewhat, um, either, you know, covering it with um, red cellophane of, or inside or uh, some co somehow covering it or um, diffusing it so that it wasn't, it didn't create such a concentrated beam. That I guess can be done with any flashlight. Um, so I don't really have, a, I'm always in search of a good flashlight. Scott, if you have one you found, I'd be very interested in hearing about it. I think we all would. Do I hold it in my mouth or set it on the table on the page? I guess are you refer I guess you're referring to when I'm writing up my notes. Um, I mean I'm writing on a I'm not writing on a computer. I'm just writing them on a notebook, my notes on a piece of paper or on a notebook pad generally, though sometimes on an actual chart that I've printed out, like a megastar chart, or even sometimes an image. Um, and well, eh, I don't I don't stick it in my um, mouth, no. Um, I have used, um, I'll either hold it or I have used, um, lamps that uh, I've read lamps that I've attached table lamps that I've um, that have been attached to an observing table also um, that were very dim. Um, 
generally I just hold it in my hand as I'm taking notes and just dim the flashlight as much as I can. Keep it dim. It's usually pretty dim. I'm usually compare, complaining about other people near me that uh, at star parties whose flashlight is too bright. But that is an important consideration. Um, as far as recording SQML readings, um, yes, I generally nowadays try to take, uh, if I re remember, try to record, and Howard does also, um, record uh, the SQML readings. Uh, I don't do it, uh, well, a couple of times during the night, but not, not at every object. Howard does it more regularly. Um, I did try a voice recorder a little bit, and I just found it too complicated to try to um, trans tra transcribe the voice recording later into um, notes. And I stopped doing it after a few times. Maybe if I had stuck with it, I, I would have found that worked better. But no, generally, I don't. I don't do that. more questions here? Well, I have a comment. Okay, we have a comment. Okay. Incredible amount of work that you've done. Did you hear oh. that? Yeah, well, thank you. Very, thank you very much. It is an incredible amount. <laughs> it, it, it does take a, it does take somewhat of a, uh, let's put it this way, uh, a, uh, an obsession that some of us have, um, com an uh, obsessive commitment um to to this hobby um, and i've definitely had that bug for uh over 45 years well this is if nothing else it's a feat of organization yeah um, i think if you looked at most people's um stash of lifetime notes that they've they've taken for their observations it would nothing would compare at least that I've ever heard of. Well, thank you, Howard. Yeah, but, um, yeah I'm, I, I've thought about doing that every so often, but um, my, my system works just fine for what I need. But uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. What was it, 23,000 now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, have you, and have you seen all the ICs now at this point? I have just about completed the IC1. Now, IC why? Why that's and and quite a bit of the IC two, but what I have tried do the why the IC one is significant. There's two different index catalogs, one and two. One only had about um, little more than fifteen hundred objects in it, but what really appealed to me is every one of them, with maybe about uh, a half a dozen or so exceptions, or may, may, maybe a dozen exceptions, a little more than that were discovered visually. So they were discovered really before the advent or the popular use of photography. Um, the surveys that were done at Harvard um, College, say in, in the North and in the South in Peru. Um, so uh, I, that really appealed to me that they were all found visually. So I have observed all the ones in the IC1. That, that's what I've completed. And those are all available online. Okay, very good. I'm so impressive. Okay, any other questions here or online? No, well, thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, Thanks Howard. Howard. Thanks for hosting. Okay, so that is a wrap for this evening. Um, and we'll, we'll pick up the, uh, the action again tomorrow morning. I think you all have the agenda. So I hope to see uh, all of, or at least most of you again tomorrow. And we have a nice crowd here in person. And right now we're going to go start our little barbecue dinner, which is uh, always a nice bonus. And might that, and let me tell you, it's a really good barbecue. <laughs> it's if no matter how far away you live from, from Portland, it's worth flying in just for the barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for watching and uh, see you all tomorrow. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody.